Good morning. It's good to see the number that we have out. We're grateful for your presence, especially the presence, presence of our visitors this morning. We're grateful that you have come our way and we're uh, glad to see you here. We're uh, inviting you anytime you have the opportunity to come back. We have services this evening at 630 and uh, we also have a uh, Bible study at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. So if you have the opportunity, uh, please come back any chance you might have. I'd invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of 3 John this morning. To the book of 3 John. <clears throat> This little epistle is one that we probably don't really hear much about. It's not typically quoted in sermons, and uh, it, it's not one that gets a lot of time in Bible study because of its uh, small nature, that it only has one chapter that has 15 verses. And yet, I, th I do think that there are a lot of things that we can learn from this epistle, and that's what we will strive to do this morning. So open up to 3 John, and let's start reading it in verse 1. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when, your, when brethren came and testified to your truth, that is, how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. So let's stop there and, and ponder these verses for a moment. Uh, it starts out, the elder to Gaius, and we don't really know why John calls himself the elder, other than maybe perhaps he was an elder, of which church we do not know, although Jerusalem seems to be uh, a good guess, though Ephesus, uh, based on tradition, would be another guess that John eventually did set up residence in Ephesus. But he calls himself the elder, and this writing style that he uh, has in Third John is easily seen in Second John and First John and also the Gospel of John, as well as a little bit in Revelation as well. So there is very little doubt that John is not the author of this book. But he writes to Gaius, and we don't really know much about Gaius either. Uh, perhaps it is a member of the church. Uh, to whom John wrote Second John. John writes in Second John, verse 1, the elder to the chosen lady and her children, and many have thought, I think correctly so, that the chosen lady or the elect lady is a church. And so Gaius may be a member. Now, we don't know which church Second John was written to. So we have, still have the question, who is Gaius? Well, there are multiple Gaiuses mentioned in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 14, Gaius is mentioned as one who Paul baptized in the church at Corinth. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 4, there is a Gaius from Derby who is mentioned as one who was traveling with Paul. But also there was one of Paul's companions who is mentioned in Acts chapter 19 and verse 29, also named Gaius. And he was from Macedonia. Or it could be another Gaius of which we have no record in the Bible. We simply do not know. However, we know a lot from Gaius about this Gaius, whoever he is, from what John writes. And John writes good things about him. He talks about how he is walking in truth. And that he has no greater joy than to hear of his children walking in truth. And when he says, my children, I believe he's talking in the spiritual sense. And really that brings up an interesting point that when we look out in, into the world, we should have joy in people walking in truth. Now that would apply to our spiritual children, people who we have helped come to the faith in Christ Jesus and perhaps even baptize them, our spiritual children. 
That would apply also to our physical children. We should have no greater joy than to see our children and hear of our children physically walking in the truth. But really, even without the idea of children, we should rejoice to see any brethren walking in the truth. When we think about this concept of rejoicing in our brethren walking in the truth, it reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that says, love rejoices in the truth. And let me tell you, when I see my brethren doing the things that they ought to do, it should give me great joy, and it does. Personally, I'm speaking here, it does give me great joy to see my brethren doing good things. And it gives me great pain to see brethren misstep or turn away from God. And as Christians, we should have this same attitude within ourselves. Let's continue reading 3 John and look at verses 5 through 8. John says to Gaius, Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers, and they have testified to your love before the church, you would do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men, so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. So John goes on to elaborate at least one instance of Gaius and how he is walking in the truth. The, the nature of the good deeds that Gaius is doing. He says that he is accomplishing things for the brethren. Specifically in supporting those who are preaching the word of God. He said they went out in the sake of the name accepting nothing from the Gentiles and, and that they were it is implied preaching the word of God. And John says we ought to support such men. And that's something that I think I can commend the brethren here. Being an evangelist myself, you have supported me and encouraged me and, and taken me in. And I appreciate that. But not just that. There are multiple men that we support with the, the funds that we have here that go overseas that you can see a map in the back of the men that we support four men in the Philippines one in South Africa one in Tennessee and I know I know that they appreciate that help and that support and what does John say if we are able to support such men he says we are fellow workers with them in the truth that we have fellowship with them and that is something that we should be doing and I can commend you for having done and I hope and pray that you will continue to do such things. But notice what John says here that he says, especially when there are strangers. I found that an interesting little thing that he adds in there that Gaius is helping people, but he says, especially when there are strangers and that really points me back to the idea of hospitality, that love of strangers, that as Christians we need to be kind to everyone, yes, but we need to have that love in our heart of strangers, that when somebody uh, comes across who, who genuinely needs help and we are able to help them, that we go out of our way to help them and lift them up in whatever way that they need, whether it be in physical monetary needs that we open our own pockets and open our own doors of our homes and whatever else may be needed, or if they need spiritual help, that we're able to sit down and take the time with them and study the word and not be afraid or not be uh, shooing them away because of how they look or how they dress or how they even how they act. We need to have that love of strangers that John talks about here. I want to continue on reading in verse 9. Reading in verse 9. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. 
For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words, and not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. So John is not just writing Gaius to commend him, but also uh, to talk to him about somebody who has become a problem. And when you look at it, Diotrephes is actually a, a contrast to what Gaius is. Gaius is loving and accepting and helping brethren along the way. But Diotrephes, filled with pride, who he says he loves to be first, he is he's refusing brethren. He is not taking them in. He forbids those to, who desire to do so as well. And he puts them out of the church. Diotrephes is everything that Gaius is not. In, in contrast. And we're told that the reason that he does so is that he loves to be first or he loves to have preeminence among them. We talked this morning in Bible class about Herod who, who died because he accepted worship from uh, the people of Tyre and Sidon and, and other subjects. And they said the voice of a God and not of man. And he did not give God the glory. And we talked about the dangers of pride. Well, here is another person who is prideful, who loves to have preeminence among the brethren. He does not accept what John the Apostle says in his authority. He accuses John and others with wicked words. And he will not receive the brethren. He is not hospitable, but rather he's causing strife and animosity And note what John says. He says, if I come, I will call attentions to his deeds, which he does. And the implication there is in a, a public manner. And, the, you know, there is time to do such a thing. I think we have to be careful about how we go about publicly calling out the deeds of others. But this Diotrephes, he is a divisive man. One who Paul says in Titus to reject a divisive man after the second and third admon admonition. Well, Diotrephes is causing strife and animosity in the church. And John says, when I come, or if I come rather, I'm going to call attention to his deeds. I'm going to let everybody know that he is a man not to be associated with. That he is being wicked in what he is doing. And brethren, there may be times in our life where we have to call somebody out publicly for what they are doing. And I pray that that doesn't be the case. I pray that, that we don't have to deal with any wicked people. Ultimately, that's the goal. But if we have to deal with someone who is acting wickedly, that that can be dealt with privately and that they will repent privately. But if not, I pray that we will have the courage. I pray that we will have the strength to do what we need to do to purify God's church. And to not let someone like this Diotrephes pervert what God has called us to do. We can't let someone who loves the preeminence to, to wreak havoc on the church. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen too many times. And we need to be aware that such men can exist. And if so, deal with them accordingly. Keep reading with me in verse 11. <clears throat> Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God, and the one who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And we add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. So John begins verse 11 with, the command to not imitate what is evil and to imitate what is good. But then he goes into one of his syllogisms, which is an if-then statement. And the if is kind of understood. 
It says, the one who does good is of, of God, and the one who does evil has not seen God. Basically, if you're good, you're from God. If you're evil, you haven't seen God. The contrast there between them. And then we're told about a man by the name of Demetrius. And again, we don't really have much information on who this Demetrius is. But what we have here in 3 John is enough to know that Demetrius is a good example. He's a, received a good testimony from everyone, from the truth itself. And John the Apostle is adding his testimony for Demetrius. Now, is this an evangelist who... Guy, uh, John wanted Gaius to bring in. Judging from the context of the book, I, I think that would be the case. That John is writing to commend Gaius and, and got, he's telling Gaius uh, to treat him as he'd already treated some evangelists in the past. But I want to bring up Demetrius. For one, he stands in contrast to Diotrephes as well. And I think that's uh, an interesting note. But John has just said that he would call attention to the deeds of Diotrephes. And there is a time and a place to call out the evil deeds of people. But John also, I think, subtly points out that there is a time and place to call out the good deeds of people. And to commend them and to encourage them and to lift them up in the eyes of the brethren. Of course, not in a haughty way, but in a way of... Giving them encouragement. Demetrius had, for whatever he had done, received a good testimony from everyone, from the truth itself. And John was adding that testimony himself, saying, yes, Demetrius, he does what is right, and I am not ashamed to say so. And brethren, when we see people who are doing good, who make fly under the radar for whatever reason because of their, their nature. Perhaps they do things in secret. It's okay sometimes to say, you know what? That person does a really good work and I commend them. And I lift them up before the, the brethren and, and I want them to feel special because they do a good job. So yes, we should call attention to people's evil deeds, but also... Call attention to people's good deeds from time to time. Keep reading with me in 13. We'll close out the short epistle here. I had many things to write to you, but I am not willing to write the, them to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and we will speak face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. So he said, I've got many things that I wanted to say, but I don't want to write them down. He says, I, want to, I hope to see you shortly and speak face to face. And that just stands out to me. He, he also says a similar thing in 2 John to the, the church that he's writing. And it just stands out to me because it <coughs> emphasizes to me the importance of being face to face. I've said it up here before, but, you know, with the, the pandemic and everything that's going on, people have been afraid to come to church. But I think John emphasizes the importance of speaking face to face and the encouragement that we get from such a thing, from such a thing, and that some things are better said and better understood when we say them face to face. Surely we can appreciate that. We understand the the science of, of body language, that not much of our communication at all, maybe twenty, ten percent if that, is verbal, and the rest is, is body language and, and also the, the tense of our how we say things. And so yes, I could I could speak to you over the phone, but you're not going to see my eyes and how my mouth is moving and, 
uh, certain cues that I would give. Yes, I could write you a letter, but you wouldn't hear the, the tense of my voice. And even on Zoom, you may be able to see me in, in the camera. You may be able to pick up on some of my body language cues. But I'm not making eye contact with you. And I'm not able to, to talk to you personally after services and that kind of thing. And so, yes, there's a, an importance to being here and speaking face to face. And, and not just, I'm not just talking about attending worship services. I'm just talking about spending time with our brethren in general. That we need to spend that time face to face and really get to know our brethren and, and to enjoy our time with them and lift one another up, bear one another's <coughs> burdens. Because I know that we all have burdens. And the only way you get to know those things is if you invest the time. John ends his letter by saying, Peace be to you, the friends greet you, greet the friends by name. Again, showing that he, he wants his brethren to have that, that intimacy. To know each other. And, and to, to greet each other by name. Now, by no means am I endorsing this show, but there's a, a famous show that has a, the theme song and it says, where everybody knows your name. What, what is being intimated there? What is implied with the, the idea of where everybody knows your name? They're like family. They're good friends. You can be comfortable there. Well, that's kind of the same idea that John is giving here, that among the brethren, we should be comfortable with one another and that we should be greeting each other by name. And so I think there are a lot of things that we can learn from 3 John, maybe even things that I didn't bring out this morning. But I hope that you have taken this study to heart and I hope that you uh, have benefited from it. This morning... You have the opportunity to become a Christian if you haven't made that choice in your life. And know that the things that I've talked about this morning, walking in truth and, and having that intimacy with your brethren and being supportive and encouraging of your brethren, those things can be yours. You can be part of a family. You can have a place where, not to, to be cheesy or anything, but you can have a place where everybody knows your name and that you belong. And that's in the Lord's church. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, know that in believing in Jesus Christ, that he is the son of God, that he is Lord, that he came to earth and died for your sins, was buried and was raised after three days. Believing that he is the Christ, repenting of your sins, turning away from sin and choosing a new life in Christ, confessing Jesus before men, and being baptized for the remission of sins. You can start that life with Christ. Maybe you are a Christian and perhaps you haven't been living the way that you should. Know that we will pray for you and that we will help you in any way that we can. But you have to let us know. If you're subject to the invitation, won't you come while we stand and sing?